and welcome to the Neo News Today podcast. As always, I am your host, Dylan of Neo News Today. In episode 65 of the NNT pod, I had a chance to sit down and speak with returning guest Tyler Adams, the co-founder and acting CEO of COZ. COZ is a developer community in the Neo ecosystem that was established in 2017 and is responsible for maintaining the Neon wallet, Dora Blockchain Explorer, and various developer tooling solutions. In this interview, Tyler and I talk about why the team is integrating the Wallet Connect protocol into Neon Wallet, participating in NEO's governance process and recent voting, a streaming payment service COZ is developing, collaborating with Translate Me to migrate its smart contracts to NEO N3, and much more. So I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation with Tyler as much as I enjoyed having it. Thank you for joining the Neo News Today podcast for the fourth time. You're the most returned guest that we've had. You're Tyler Adams of COZ, but maybe in your words, just for guests who have never listened to one of our podcasts or have never heard of you, could you just tell us who you are and what you do at COZ? Yeah, so I'm Tyler Adams, and I'm the operating, I guess, the acting CEO of COZ, which is formerly known as City of Zion. I work with a lot of the, the community members and community developers that the ecosystem is familiar with, like Co Mountain Climber, Hal, My Thousand, um, IXJE, Rick Lock, that kind of that team. Um, and we build out a lot of the, both the, what I would call like the, the consumer level experience for the Neo ecosystem, as well as a lot of the developer experience, the developer tools. Um, and then we also support some of like the, what I call the product experience features as well. For me personally, um, I kind of touch a lot of the different aspects of each of those, um, ranging from project strategy um, all the way down to development. So I kind of do a little bit of everything, usually just enough to break things for the real developers to show up and fix them. Awesome. One of the more tangible products that COZ offers is the Neon Wallet, which is actually really cool because that was one of the first wallets I ever downloaded when I got Neo off of Shapeshift back in 2017. And that was kind of the aha moment for why I wanted to learn more about Neo because I saw like gas distributions in the app. And I was like, well, what's gas? And that opened up the rabbit hole for me. And I noticed that like a lot of people in the ecosystem really value and, and appreciate the Neon Wallet. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Neon Wallet recently integrated support for Wallet Connect. So I think maybe we can start this portion of the conversation off just hearing your insights as to the updates for Neon Wallet and like what has gone into them. And if you could also just do like an Eli 5 as to what Wallet Connect is. Sure. So we've recently, I think it was last, or actually it was this week, it was a couple of days ago, as of this recording, released the production version of Wallet Connect within Neon Wallet. Previously, for kind of an extended period of time, we had a, a release candidate that was available. It's kind of a big deal for the N3 ecosystem specifically, because it's it effectively makes Neo one of the very first not Ethereum blockchains to actually use Wallet Connect, if not the first. Um, so Wallet Connect recently, that team has been working on Wallet Connect 2, um, which is not tightly coupled to the Ethereum blockchain. And we have been integrating that solution since its alpha release. Um, and now it's in beta, which is what we have in, implemented in the Neon Wallet. Now. Wallet Connect is a, it's a DAP interoperability protocol for wallets. So what it allows you to do, or what it allows DAPs to do is to really easily request secure key access from users, right? So generally speaking, if you wanted to use a DAP or, you know, just interface with a smart contract, you would have to download an application or go to a website and stick your private key into the platform, right? Or you could use like an offline signing mechanism, which has kind of a pain point in terms of UX. 
Um, so what this does is it allows somebody to go to adapt and they can just click a button, right? And then the request to sign the transaction shows up right in their wallet. And then they can securely do that from within their wallet and interface with the decentralized application. This also makes it really easy for developers because now DAP developers don't need to deal with any of this, this functionality, right? They just have to literally implement our SDK, which, you know, exposes the button. Um, we've provided, we've even exposed a, like a connection portal into the SDK as well. Um, so it's really pretty streamlined in terms of getting DAPs up and running with contract invocations from their users. Um, so that's really the, how it, what it does. You know, our first example of this that's really in public is um, the QuickVote app, which Hal and Malenki put together. And that has effectively allowed people to vote on Neo using Neon Wallet, but then also because Neon Wallet supports Ledger, it's allowed Ledger users to also vote, which is a pretty large user base within our community. Um, we have a lot of hardware wallet users in our ecosystem. I think we'll see in the near future, a lot of these apps that are building on Neo right now, integrating Wallet Connect. Um, COZ also has a number of projects that will be implementing it as well. So we've, we're putting a lot of focus on this technology. Um, and there are even some improvements in our existing desktop wallet that will add upon that as well. So why did the team opt to integrate Wallet Connect? Is it it's especially because it was alpha and now it's beta? And I know that when I'm playing around in various ecosystems, I see that like I can use my MetaMask wallet or a Wallet Connect wallet. And I've always been a bit hesitant to explore the Wallet Connect side because just from my experience with Neon Wallet, there were a whole bunch of steps that I needed to go through. So how will this make the end user's life easier as opposed to the current standard or whatever it is you want to call it that Neon Wallet uses now? Yeah. So um, just to preface, that was the before what Neon Wallet used to use. One of the big things that we, we like about Wallet Connect, so it's open source. It's a, a global ecosystem level standard, which I think is important, right? So the original Wallet Connect would have had issues. It was very difficult. It would have been very difficult for us to implement on Neo, right? primarily because of the links into to Ethereum. And if we implemented that standard, which currently is kind of the, one of the, the well-known ecosystem options, as you mentioned, um, we would already be implementing something with a plan to decommission, right? Or an obsolescence strategy, because there's already a new version that's coming out, right? Uh, or a new major version. This will probably, you know, say in a year or two or longer, like if we are talking about wallet integration across the ecosystem or bringing dApps in, I think the, the way to think about Wallet Connect 2 and why we chose that protocol is that say you're a dApp in another ecosystem like Ethereum, for example, and you already have Wallet Connect support implemented in your application. Well, we already have a wallet in the Neo ecosystem which supports Wallet Connect, right? And that protocol and that arch interface architecture. Um, so it becomes very easy for a DAP to come over into the Neo ecosystem or add support for Neo. And all they're doing is adding the Neo protocol of Wallet Connect, right? That's all that they have to do to add support, um, as opposed to to adding another kind of protocol into their into their application. Um, now, of course, that's pretty much every application right now is using Wallet Connect 1, so there's a difference there. But architecturally, there still are a lot of similarities. Um, and moving forward, I would expect there to be more and more applications which are using this new protocol version. So that's the main reason why we've chosen to use Wallet Connect 2. Cool. I want to take a small little sidestep while we're still on Neon Wallet. And uh, Edge asked about this when I was talking to the team. Are there any plans for some sort of like custom network for in Neon Wallet local testing? Is that in the works? That's probably the longest or most outstanding feature request 
um, for that project. It's been requested for actually for years now. And, you know, I generally think of with Neon Wallet, we try to push new features and new like tech advancements in that product as much as possible. But a lot of the time we are trying to keep up with the ecosystem and to make sure that, you know, our users are really safe. They feel confident with the wallet. They want to use it. So that's one of those features that historically has fallen by the wayside a little bit. One thing that we would like to add, though, is the custom protocol. Um, We've actually discussed that a lot also on the mobile side. It does help with testing as well, right? So being able to have a private test net that's set up for like dedicated wallet testing has been nice in the past. I think we'll probably see the priority of that increase with the, the advent of Wallet Connect in the ecosystem. Right. So as there's a more of a direct interface with the wallet to like developer ecosystems or like private nets, for example, for like integration with Wallet Connect, we'll probably see an increased need for private net connectivity in the wallet itself. Um, since right now the developer experience is kind of with the wallet is kind of dedicated to testnet. That being said, there is the Aero web wallet as well, which allows private net connectivity and it supports Wallet Connect. So one of the features, maybe the first feature is QuickVote into implementing Wallet Connect. So as a user, this is a way that I can participate in governance, but COZ is one of the council members on the Neo Council, which is responsible for participating in the direction of the growth of the network and changing parameters and things like that. And the second successful vote also just happened on the NEO Council. The first was to reduce transaction fees. And then the second was to reduce Oracle request fees. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what participating in NEO N3's governance has been like from your perspective as the CEO of COZ? So it's been a pretty good experience um, so far, just, you know, at a top level. Generally, there's actually been pretty good consensus about what needs to change. I think some of the numbers, there's been some, some discussion about like, for example, like how low do we go with the fees, for example, but generally, there everybody's been in agreement, at least about the general direction. We haven't really had any, any hard discussions yet. Although I think there's kind of this general expectation from all of the people in the council that, you know, we're still kind of in this tweaking phase of N3, right? So we have these initial or these default parameters, right, which have been set. but those may not reflect what we actually need to have this ecosystem where we want it to be, right? Um, So that's where a lot of these changes have been made, right? So the first one was actually made as a direct result of some of the NFT work that's being done in the ecosystem currently, right? So we were looking at what the minting cost of NFTs is and how we can drive that down to compete against other ecosystems on price, right? And I don't know what the minting cost on like Ethereum is, for example, but I can, I'm pretty sure that we're probably decent, (laughs) comparatively speaking. Um, I can almost guarantee that we compete pretty well on costs there. I can assure you that we compete now on Oracle costs by quite a bit. So we're really, in a lot of cases, we don't even look at Ethereum anymore for competition in terms of fees structure, right? Because it's just, it's so blown up. We look at a lot of these other kind of emerging platforms and we're looking even ahead of that to make it even more competitive. So I think really like there's this general consensus of like unspoken consensus amongst the, com- the council that um, we really want to be a, like an economic solution for developers, right? Especially right now, invocation costs are pretty, can be very pricey. We can provide a performant um, economic alternative. So for us, like for CZ, um, for example, because we build a lot of the developer tools, 
I think our motivation is probably aligned pretty heavily with a lot of the rest of the community. So we want to incentivize developers to come and build on our platform. At least right now, our operating direction is generally to reduce the fee structure as far, you know, as much as reasonably possible to compete. Of course, with when also considering like the exploit risk, right? So flood attacks and things like that are a consideration as well that we also bear the burden of handling. But yeah, in general, we'll be typically advocates for reducing the fees. I don't know. It's been a good experience. It is really, this is kind of a funny piece of this though, watching the way that the voting is occurring and what's like prioritizing people's votes has been very interesting. And it's kind of terrifying also because you're incentivized, like generally speaking, the community is incentivized to vote for the lowest ranking council member, right? For the lowest voted or council member with the lowest number of votes. So what we see is this like continual, like almost a Ferris wheel of your position amongst the nodes. So we're a lot of the council members were like kind of sitting there watching this, like, oh, am I going to get bumped out? Am I going to go up? Am I going to get just under? Like, what's going on with it? So it definitely, it's something that we watch. So it's kind of, it, it's a bit of a hot seat, I guess, also. Yeah. And, and what you're talking about is with NEO's governance, the top 21 council members receive rewards for for being in the council. And if you get bumped up to spot 22, then you're out of the top 21 and and no longer receive gas rewards. And the user who votes for the 22nd or higher ranked node also stops receiving gas rewards. So there's that sort of economic incentive that people are playing with. And we've also seen Burger Neo develop not only a wrapper similar to NNEO, but also a dynamic governance solution that cycles through these nodes as well to provide users with the most optimal gas returns. So that's a little bit of background context for folks who are listening to this. Now, from the internal perspective, as like a a council member, the way that folks vote and communicate is done by one-on-one talking with one another, one-on-one discussions. Not everything is necessarily... Uh, like so public as a DAO is where something is proposed and then things are discussed publicly. Now, maybe this changes as the Neo network becomes more in tune and aligned with what governance processes will look like. And, and as, as more and more decentralization occurs to the council members, but what are some of the areas that work well or could be improved upon with the current way that council members communicate with one another when it comes to potential votes? Yeah, so I think there are a couple of things there. One thing that I have some concerns about that are, they're being addressed, but it has to do with this idea of like, and I use the term railroading a lot, but this idea that if you get general approval, like if you can get a vote through, that it doesn't matter what the, the opinions of the other council members are on this, this topic, right? And this becomes particularly interesting when everybody is geographically decentralized because there, it does introduce the opportunity for a, you know, a situation where the vote proposal happens in one time zone and there's an approval across the time zones before all the council members can even see what the proposal was. So that's something that we've been looking at and kind of defining solutions to right now. One of the other things that actually is probably the biggest one to us as COZ, kind of this community developer organization, is this idea of transparency. So for us, it's really important that the community is engaged and providing input into what is best for the network and the ecosystem, right? You know, especially right now, since the network is in this, what I'd call like a pseudo decentralized state, right? So We are council members, but we're council members because the NEO Foundation has voted us in, right? So I think it it is really important for us to get that input from the community because moving forward, as that that single point of strength decreases, the community is really going to be the ones who are deciding who is council member. And um, I think listening to the community is probably the best way to remain a council member. (laughs) And I know that this sentiment is shared amongst all of the other developer communities as well. 
Um, that's something that we all share in common or have in common. So having the transparency is pretty important. There are some initiatives within the team to implement that or add a lot of transparency to these discussions. Um, so I think we'll probably be seeing some of these tools show up or these processes showing up in the near future. I'm definitely excited about them. I had a, some discussions with people about like our reduction of some of the fees, right? So there's some of the gas maximalists in the ecosystem freaking out about the gas cost for these invocations going down and it like tanking the gas price and things like that. My response is just that more transactions is probably the better approach there to keep the gas demand high. But it would be good to get more, you know, more proactive engagement from the community on these topics. I represent a developer community. So, and there are certain things that we consider and there are certain things we don't consider, right? So having the entire kind of the holistic collection of data from our community is really nice to have when making these decisions. Yeah, there are different interests from industries that are represented by participants on the council. Like, for example, COZ is a developer community, whereas Everstake is a staking as a service company. So maybe there are just two different levels of considerations, which I think can add to the robust nature of um, how things are decided upon and why. And I'm not necessarily saying that. Uh, one way is is good or bad. I actually think that a different group of incentives can probably help make the network a bit more resilient because there are different people thinking from different angles. Now, you did mention a couple times in this previous segment that COZ is, is itself a developer community. And before the Neo Frontier Launchpad Hackathon in the summer, which created all sorts of really cool projects that are going to be launching in the next couple quarters. COZ hosted its own hackathon, kind of like an internal flyby testing hackathon. And a really cool project came out of that called Cripsidra. I can describe what Cripsidra is, but I think uh, I'll defer to you. So can you just share with the Neo News Today listeners what Cripsidra is? and maybe how the average user might be able to interact with it once it's available publicly. Sure. So this Cripsidra project, and it'd actually probably be a good podcast episode to get that team on. I think it would be very interesting. I don't want to throw Hal and Malenke <laughs> under the bus if they don't want to participate, but it would be really interesting to hear, especially since Hal I know is kind of a a community celebrity to some degree. But yeah, Cripsidra really, in their own words, stemmed from some of these issues within COZ as an organization, historically more so than now, um, regarding just like funds fulfillment or like payment situations, right? So what it really does is it allows you to stream tokens from one location to another. Um, so it's a really, it's a pretty simple concept, but it has a lot of uses in a bunch of different areas, including um, remittance, right? Where you can set up, if you think, and if you think about remittance, it is, it's periodic. It's, it's effectively a stream, right? It's a discrete stream of, of assets or tokens or fiat or whatever you want to call it. So that's really what Cripsidra handles, where somebody can go in. Cripsidra was actually the first Wallet Connect project. There actually were a couple other um, flyby hackathon projects which implemented prototype Wallet Connect as well that we'll be looking at also. But this one specifically implemented Wallet Connect and it would allow a user to connect and they could set up a, a stream of tokens. So for example, I could go in and I could say, well, Dylan, I'm going to give you we'll say $2,000 in NEO or gas, right? And it's going to be paid out over two months time, right? For the work that you're contributing to NEO News Today or because you're a buddy and, you know, you earn some beer or whatever we want to say, right? So you can go in and you effectively stake those assets on the contract, right? And then over that time window, 
those assets mature. And at any time during that period or after, you could go in and you can claim or withdraw the assets up to the period of time that is like now, right? So if half of the time has passed, you could withdraw half the assets. Um, so it's a really simple kind of concept, but it really is pretty clever. Um, there are a lot of really interesting use cases for it. Um, so that's something that we've been very slowly making progress on, but I think it, it'll it probably be showing up as a Wallet Connect application in the near future for people to use. Yeah, that's really cool to say, you know, I'm going to commission you for a project and you say it's going to take a month, then we'll put the funds up and you can't just like claim them all on day one and then just abscond. Right. Which is a really interesting use case. And I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about if this was possible on Neo Legacy and if it was or was not, then can you share how N3 kind of empowers the Cryptsidra DAP? So one of the things that I think is really important to understand with the difference between Neo Legacy and Neo N3 is that with Neo Legacy for Cryptsidra, for example, we could have implemented something like this. However, it would not have been as easy. It actually would have been pretty difficult to do, specifically the withdrawal, like the funds withdrawal, right? So I think having the MEP, the fact that in this case, there's a native token component um, that helps a lot in some cases, um, especially with triggering the smart contract and setting everything up. You don't have to deal with the different types of invocations, for example. So would it the, the question like to would it be possible in your legacy? Yeah, it would have been. Would it have been something I would expect to see in a one-week hackathon in Neo Legacy? Probably not, right? Even I wouldn't have expected, especially at the level of polish that it was at. I mean, it, that team really did develop and deliver a, like a functioning DAP um, that was ready for people to use. And actually, we have used it. We've been using it. We used it for testing for our Wall Connect solution that's now in production. So it was our test platform or one of them for that. Yeah, so I think that's probably the best answer is that, you know, was it implement? Could we do it on Neo Legacy? Would it have been as straightforward as the entry imp- implementation? Definitely not. There would probably be some backend service that would have to exist, which adds a lot more complexity, like this app, just so everybody's aware. There is no back. It's a static website and a smart contract. So it, the entire backend is on chain, which is kind of the truest form of a a decentralized application that you can have, right? Although I suppose you could not have a front end, right? So just a smart contract would be another, but you still have to have some sort of interface. So it's pretty pretty pure in that regard, which I'm a big fan of. Um, It also keeps maintenance really low. Speaking of smart contracts, this is an awesome transition into something that kind of excited me when I saw the announcement two weeks ago. And that is that, uh, Translate Me, which is one of Neo's longest running dApps in the ecosystem now, and COZ uh, have struck up a collaborative partnership. I don't know what the specific words we want to use, but the two entities are going to collaborate with one another. And COZ is going to help migrate Translate Me smart contracts from legacy to N3. So, what does this partnership or collaboration look like? What, do, what are you guys calling it? And how will COZ help Translate Me come over to the N3 ecosystem? Yeah, so there, there are a couple facets of this, um, this relationship. So I think it was recently announced that Translate Me has joined the early adopter program, right? Um, so one of the value propositions that I think the early adopter program comes with is some access to developer support. You know, we've been working with the Translate Me team to not just migrate them over, but to also build out their contract platform. And it is a really kind of a natural fit. Um, They've been in the ecosystem for a very long time. You know, we're using the tools that our team has built effectively to facilitate this. So that's really how the relationship has started. We've been engaged with them on some kind of technical Decision making um, and some discussions on that, you know, what some future ideas for the project could be and stuff. It's a really good 
interesting project. I would recommend that people look at it. The business case that the team puts forward is really, it's very clever and it, it definitely makes sense. It's good. It definitely fulfills a niche that's been kind of ignored generally. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons they have so many users, right? They have a pretty healthy number of active users. So I don't know. I've enjoyed working with the team, the C of Z, the rest of the C of Z organization has. They're good to work with. I'm pretty excited to see what they come up with. But yeah, so the, the relationship extends a little bit further than just the, the migration activity. That's what we're starting to work on right now. Um, or we're focused on getting them over to N3. Um, we also have an architecture that's been defined for extending the decentralization of their platform as well onto the N3 solution. And moving forward, is this going to be, because it translate me as part of the early adoption program. So this is a, a collaborative inter-ecosystem relationship. But moving forward, is this something like a service that COZ is going to offer for, for projects that are potentially from outside the ecosystem? I think it depends. COZ, generally, we look for certain things when we, we want to work with a project. Um, Translate Me really checked all of those boxes for us. It is something that we've begun exploring. Um, we've actually we've been doing this a little bit more lately. The primary interest for us is to bring projects in and develop it and grow the NEO ecosystem, right? So, you know, I think it's pretty reasonable for us to say that if there are projects that are interested in getting their feet wet in NEO, or they're interested in doing like a full migration or even adding support, that we're open to that, um, that conversation. Since in a lot of cases, we will have, again, built the tools that they would be using anyways. But yeah, that is, that's something that we've discussed also with the eco-growth team. Um, so they are aware of that. We definitely have the right skill set to bring these projects into NEO. Um, so we want to leverage that in any way we can to make sure that M3 is a success. And kind of wrapping up and looking forward, uh, C, you know, Cripsidra is just one of the, the many things that COZ is working on, not only from a product perspective, but then there's also the services you guys are offering with the migration of Translate Me smart contracts. And we didn't really get to dig deep into NFTs and Neon Wallet, but maybe this can kind of act as a catch-all. What can users expect coming out of COZ in the coming months? What can Neo community members uh, look forward to? Sure. So there are a couple of things you know, depending on when this podcast is released, um, we'll have a new product that's out in public for people to use that's been kind of a really long time coming. So that should be out and there should be a public release for a new project that we've been working on. Um, we've also been closely integrating or working with a lot of the various projects in the ecosystem right now on Wallet Connect integration. So I think we'll see a lot of projects starting to show up that um, will be using that protocol natively. So if you're a Neon Wallet user, that's something you can look forward to. And that would be um, integrated into multiple COZ core products as well. The, the other thing that you can probably, or the ecosystem can probably look forward to um, is more native features within the wallet. So, you know, we recently added some updates to the activity tab, right? We've added um, support for voting, for example, and contract invocations. We've also added support for NFTs in the activity tab. So you can probably read between the lines that, you know, we'll be probably adding some more features there associated with those types of things as well. Um, we have been collaborating or working pretty closely with like Ghost Market, for example. So they're, they're also kind of in the, the COZ ecosystem to some extent. Awesome. And kind of wrapping up, I'm excited to ask you this question because you've been in the ecosystem since the AntShares days. So we're, we're going into the fifth year that you've been contributing to, <laughs> to the ecosystem. And we just went through this major upgrade. So I guess maybe for the first half of 2022, what 
ecosystem initiatives and maybe not just COZ, but just like in broadly in NEO, what are you excited about for what the first half of 2022 can offer us? There are a couple of things. Actually, there are a lot of things I'm pretty excited about in the ecosystem right now. I think the obvious thing that I'm excited about and I'm hopeful for is exposure of you know, all of the shiny toys in the NEO ecosystem to the outside of the NEO bubble. COZ was just tagged on a tweet the other day or recently where like somebody wasn't even aware, like NEO supports all of these different languages, right? Like people aren't even aware that that's the case. And I feel like that's been the case for since the beginning, right? So there's a lot of that type of stuff where I think there are a lot of really awesome features um, in our ecosystem that just people don't, aren't even aware they haven't even heard of it, right? Because we just kind of talk in this, this echo chamber. So I'm excited for a lot, some of that to start showing up outside or kind of seeping, seeping out. Um, and we're starting to see that a little bit. I think one of the things within COZ that I'm excited about is like smart contract scalability and interoperability. That's what we're really pushing on. So things like Wallet Connect, for example, We've really, we've started to build mature a lot of our tools. So we'll start kind of going up a level in terms of what we're implementing, right? I think people will start to see some of that soon. You know, you mentioned the Cryptsidra project. So actually building out some of these dApps that the ecosystem needs. There are a couple others that are in the works as well. So that's one thing, you know, the dApp scalability is another thing that, We've been working on. Um, so the BOA team has been really pushing on that um, with things like you know multiple file support, class user defined classes, um, class inheritance. These concepts that allow people to build contracts at scale. You know, it's and they're not necessarily they're not critical to building smart contracts, but they do help um, manage complexity. So there's a lot of features like that that we're building out as well. Outside of the ecosystem, there's a project, and I don't know if it's actually been publicly announced. I don't remember, but there's this like grant shares project that I'm very excited about that Axe Labs has kind of grabbed from community discussions. I know like Neo News Today was very involved in that, that work as well. I'm pretty excited about that. I think that will help invigorate the community. So I think those are kind of the big the big ones, you know, I am very excited about the, the DAP support with wallets, like the Wallet Connect integration. I think that's going to kind of create a, a situation where building DAPs is like a trivial thing. You know, I look at, and granted, this is a, was a HAL project. So it, you know, and he works magic. Um, but like the Quick Vote app was something that he spun up in just like a couple days, right? Or a day or two. It's a full DAP. So I think that it's really like that integration is really going to help drive community growth in the future. So I'm, I'm pretty excited for that over the next you know, couple of months. We'll probably start seeing a lot of this longer term. And I know you didn't ask about it, um, but I am really, I still kind of believe in this concept of a smart economy and these DAP, like this DAP interconnectivity and contract to contract interfacing, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that in the next year where you have contracts on multiple pro on different projects interfacing with each other. Um, we'll probably see a lot more abstract or general use contracts showing up, right? Which just have a collection of methods that may not necessarily be their own product, but they have some value proposition in themselves that people want to make contract calls to. Um, to use instead of like rewriting their code all the time, like every single time they deploy a contract. So I think we'll see a lot of that type of scaling as well. So I, I don't know. I think there's a lot to be looking forward to. Obviously, there's probably some more events that will be showing up as well. I think those will be very exciting too. I don't know. Lots to look forward to in the ecosystem, I think, in the next six months to a year. Yeah. So I just have one more comment. So in case listeners aren't aware, I'm the guy that sometimes responds on Reddit or on Discord with like the LLL, WVL, VWLL. Comes up like some random dude, keeps messaging or like makes a statement. <laughs> cool. So <laughs> that's your 
your social media handle. Yeah, that's my sign out and for the podcast too. Yeah, and you've always you've been answering uh, questions from the community and been public facing for for quite some time. So yeah, thanks a ton for for coming back on the podcast and sharing the great work that COZ and you have been up to, and also just kind of giving us some you know a, a radar for things to look forward to in the coming months and. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you again in person at an event and um, definitely look forward to having you come back on a, a podcast in a future episode. Yeah, one other really quick thing I think it's important for people to be aware, like if there are any questions or, you know, people want to talk about this, these topics, you know, they can tag me in the social media channels or platforms and I don't visit them every hour kind of a thing, but I do try to, to address tags either the day of or the next day, that kind of thing. So, so we try to make our, like from, this is a COZ thing. We try to make ourselves pretty accessible um, as needed. Well, there you have it. If you have any questions, you know exactly who to reach out to. Thanks for, for joining and uh, we'll catch you next time. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Well, what did you think of that conversation? I thought it was really cool to learn that the NEO ecosystem may be the first or at least among the first non-Ethereum ecosystems to integrate support for Wallet Connect. It was also nice to hear a little bit more about the governance decision-making processes from the perspective of a NEO council member and Tyler's vision for increased transparency moving forward. And it was also nice to learn more about the collaboration with TranslateMe and how both entities might continue to work with one another beyond migrating the smart contracts from legacy to N3. So I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Neo News Today podcast, and we look forward to catching you next time.